it soon afterwards to say that the editor of the USA Today had had this angry phone call from a member of the skeptic organization saying they discredited their newspaper, that I was a, a pseudo-scientist and a charlatan and they'd been duped. And in future, any stories they um, wrote about telepathy or nonsense like that should be checked with the proper scientific authorities, namely themselves first, so they could issue a comment. Uh, so this kind of proactive way of influencing the media, attacking the people who provide the platform. They attack the editors. It's no coincidence that Coyne attacked Ted. He attacked Ted more than he attacked me. Is their way of trying to maintain um, a control over what appears in the serious media. So now the, they also have, um, in the Skeptical Inquirer last year, I subscribed to it because I feel I need to know what they're up to. Um, I also subscribed to the British Skeptic magazine. There was an article by a woman skeptic advocating skeptics to get involved in their campaign to make sure that Wikipedia reflects what they see as the true scientific position on things like telepathy and pseudoscience. And they have lots of people who are, well, I don't know how many, but they have a significant number of dedicated activists um, working in Wikipedia uh, making sure that at every possible, in every possible way it reflects the materialist and skeptic point of view. Um, and they le they've learned the rules, they've become expert editors, and they've infiltrated uh, Wikipedia um, because, as they uh, argued in the Skeptical Inquirer, this is where most children and students get their information from, and indeed where most people get their information from. So it's very important for them that it reflects the skeptical point of view. So they've had a determined campaign, and I think it's a probably a relatively small group of activists, but they're committed, active, proactive, uh, whereas people who work in psychical research or in other branches of more unconventional science haven't been spending their time um, trying to influence the media and get their message to dominate the airwaves. They've been getting on with doing their research. So I think that's uh, the reason they got into this position. And I think the other reason they've been so successful is that there's nothing new in this campaign. If you look back to the late 19th century, skeptics and materialists were carrying out very much the same kind of campaign against psychical research even then. And this kind of aggressive, scornful, dismissive style of polemic uh, was already well in place in the 19th century. Uh, nothing much has changed, really, except that um, they now have even more media to put their view across in, and um, they probably increased their, their influence over the serious media. I think a lot of, I mean, it depends who I'm talking to. I give seminars, I'm giving one in a couple of months' time, at Chris French's department at Goldsmiths College London, which is, he's the main professor of skepticism in Britain. He's professor of anomalous psychology. And this, this is the, one of the main academic hotbeds of skepticism. I give talks there, people listen, they, we have reasonable discussions, um, and they know about the results. And very few of the people there exhibit this kind of prejudiced skepticism that I encounter all too often, a, a kind of ignorant, bigoted type of skepticism. Um, I think one of the reasons that there's so much of that is that people who are really skeptical have such a strong belief that they, sh they know in advance the evidence must be wrong. You say, if you believe it's impossible, then if I come along and say, here's results that show it's possible, either it proves I'm a fool, I've done the experiment so badly or incompetently, I've got false positive results and haven't been s smart enough to see it, or I'm a fraud, I'm trying to deceive you and the world. And so the instant reaction is one of hostility and accusing people of being fools or frauds. Um, mm. Richard Dawkins, who's a very smart man, um, is in this area not very smart at all. He's a very bigoted skeptic and he came to interview me for his most recent TV series in Britain. He had one against religion, a two-part polemic called 
the root of all evil. And his most recent series was called Enemies of Reason. Uh, it was about research in parapsychology and alternative medicine. Um, they didn't tell me it was called Enemies of Reason beforehand when they asked me to take part, but I've had enough experience of these negative uh, media treatments, and I'd seen his previous series that I was very suspicious, and I said I'd only agree to take part if it's a genuine scientific discussion about evidence, uh, and uh, if he's really open to discussing the evidence, otherwise there's no point. And they gave me a written, and I said I want it in writing, they gave me a written assurance that this was the case. So I agreed to meet him, and he came to see me. And he's, we started off, there was a handheld camera, they put us facing each other. Um, and he started off by saying, he said, I dare say we agree about quite a number of things, Rupert. He said, but let me tell you what worries me about you. And I said, OK, what worries me about me? And he said, what worries me about you is you're prepared to believe almost anything. And science should be based on the minimum number of beliefs. So I said, well, OK. well." Let me tell you what worries me about you. I said, you come across as prejudiced and bigoted, and I think you give science a bad name. So we didn't get much very far with that <laughs> conversation. <laughs> so then he said, the trouble with telepathy is that people are, he said, oh no, then he said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. It's a standard skeptical slogan. So I said, well, what's the extraordinary claim? I said, the majority of sane, normal people in Britain believe they've had telepathic experiences. In that sense, it's not extraordinary, it's ordinary. Most people have had it. You're making the claim that most people are deluded about their own experience. Where's your extraordinary evidence for that? Uh, he couldn't produce any at all. You know, he just said, oh, people have a very false sense of statistics and probability and stuff, generic arguments. Then I said, well, look, OK, why don't we get down to the evidence and actually discuss the evidence, uh, which is why we've met? And he said, I don't want to talk about the evidence. And I said, well, why not? And he said, there isn't time. And I said, well, we've got plenty of time. He said, it's too complicated. And I said, no, it isn't. He said, anyway, it's not what this program's about. And so I said, well, <laughs> I, um, he didn't know. I'd sent him my papers, three or four papers, two weeks before so he could look at them. He hadn't looked at them. And he was just trying to trap me into saying something silly and then put that on TV. Right. So I said, um, OK, well, then, uh, then there's been a misunderstanding, because I said I didn't want to take part in yet another low-grade debunking program. He said, it's not a low-grade debunking program. It's a high-grade debunking program. <laughs> <laughs> so then the producer said, cut, and the cameras stopped rolling. And, and so um, then I said to the, 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 the director, um, is this a debunking program or not? He said, yes, it's another Richard Dawkins polemic. And I said, then you're here under false pretenses because you told me it was about evidence. He said, I didn't. I said, well, your assistant did. He said, can you prove it? And I said, yes. And I produced the email with this. And I said, I I'm afraid um, there's been a serious misunderstanding. He said, well, I'm afraid I have to agree with you. That she should never have told you that. That's not what it's about. It's a polemic. Um, and um, I said, well, I'm going to have to ask you to leave my house and I didn't sign a release. I wouldn't actually mind if all that was put on the TV, but I've written up an account of this. It's on my website. Mm. It's been published in several British journals. Called, uh, if you want to read the details, it's on an account called Richard Dawkins Comes to Call. <laughs> um, but the, that's an example, you see, of someone with a huge media presence, an enormous intellectual prestige, because a lot of people think he's an incredibly smart guy who speaks mm. for science. In this area, whatever his virtues as a geneticist, he, it, he doesn't know anything about it. He's speaking from prejudice and ignorance. And, and that's a very bad thing to do if you are, as he is, professor of public understanding of science. It doesn't further a public understanding of science. And that, I'm afraid, is why the, the debate on this is not often based on evidence and very often based on prejudice, stereotypes, and, and ignorance. Um, ever since Dean came here uh, earlier this year, I've been telling a lot of people about Psy. Um, and basically, the conversation usually ends as soon as the person I'm speaking with thinks of James Randi. And they yes. kind of put up a James Randi shield where they won't let anything get past. And yes. I was wondering what your response to that is. Well, for the benefit of those who don't know about him, there's a conjurer called James Randi who often appears on TV. And he's a, a very anti... He's, he's one of these ideologically motivated skeptics who believes Psy is impossible. 
And he's offered a million dollar prize, or says he has. It's, there's a lot of questions as to whether he actually has the million dollars or where it is, uh, for any successful test of Psi. And people often say, why don't you apply for the Randy Prize? Well, it's a very good question, and I can tell you my answer. First of all, this man is not a scientist. He has, very, he has no scientific credentials or understanding. In, on his website, it says the prize must be won for people who produce an unequivocal, de unequivocal demonstration of psi abilities that requires no expert analysis. That seems to rule out any statistical experiments. Then he's later said, oh, well, I will accept statistical experiments, but the odds against chance have got to be a million to one to get the million dollar prize. So if the odds against chance are 900,000 to one, you fail the test. Third, you sign over to Randy all publicity rights. You have all legal waivers. Uh, so he has complete control of all publicity arising from this. And fourth, and most important for me, he's a liar. I, he's, a, he's a deceiver by profession, and he's a deceiver by nature. And my reason for saying this, without being sued for libel, is that um, he wrote an article in a magazine about my dog research called Dog World. Probably very few of you read Dog World, but <laughs> lots of people do. And in this he said that uh, we at the James Randi Educational Foundation have repeated Sheldrake's experiments, they fail. Then he said, we've also examined all his videotape from his experiments and shown the dog goes to the window all the time, and it's not as he says it is. An unequivocal statement. I emailed him asking him to tell, give me the details of the experiments he'd done. What journal were they published in? Where's the data? Reasonable questions that a scientist would ask. He didn't reply. I emailed again. He didn't reply. So I, e I emailed his scientific advisory board, and they advised him to reply. So he then replied, and he said, well, um, actually, uh, these experiments were done many years ago when I looked after a, a friend's dogs for a couple of weeks in New York and I lost all the data. They were lost in a flood, so I've got no data and uh, they've never been written up. So what kind of evidence is that? If I produce evidence for Psy and say, well, I did them years ago, I've lost all the data, but just believe me, he wouldn't go for that, I'm sure. And then uh, the examination of the videotapes, he had to admit he'd never seen the videotapes. He'd simply made that up. Now, with a man with such a low degree of honesty, I don't think he should be an arbiter of scientific credibility or truth. I do believe, however, that real skeptics, people with proper skeptic scientific training and, and who have a track record of honesty rather than dishonesty, are worth engaging with. And that's why I'm doing joint experiments with Professor Chris French right now.